off West 1380. I understand your emergency. Let me know when you want to go in. Yeah, we have a part of the aircraft missing, so we're going to need to slow down a bit. Hero in my book, that lady, the pilot from that Southwest flight, Tammy Jo Schultz, stayed unbelievably calm during the whole thing. That was some of the audio released already from the tower, uh, between the tower and the plane while this whole thing happened. NTSB investigating on the ground in Philadelphia to find out what happened. Our aviation expert, Jay Ratliff, on the line right now. Jay, thanks for your time again. Seems like we've brought you in many times already over the past six months, but nothing quite like this. How about that pilot, though? Well, you're you're talking about a a woman that was what the first female fighter pilot for the U.S. Navy. So best of the best. If if I'm in an emergency situation, uh, that's who I want at the helm. But yeah, you know, really, these men and women uh, who are commercial pilots, many of them have a military background. Uh, they know exactly what they're doing, and I've listened to more audio tapes from emergency situations than I would care to yeah. to recall. And more often than not, it's unbelievable professionalism, even in the face of incredible danger uh, and sometimes imminent danger, uh, where they know the likelihood of of the aircraft surviving is minimal. But uh, just an incredible job here. Now, look, pilots are trained to land an aircraft on one engine like you you and I would run down to the corner of convenience stores. It's (laughs) not a big deal. But the problem is when you have an engine that is compromised, as this one was, uh, the the fear is, did it compromise any of the hydraulic systems on board that aircraft? And mm-hmm. it won't be until the investigation is complete that we'll be able to understand and ascertain just how crippled that particular aircraft was. Uh, United Airlines Flight 232 back in uh, 1989 had an engine failure that knocked out all the hydraulics. Wow. The crew basically could only fly the airplane with the throttle of the aircraft, and that was it. Wow. Um, and they were able to land, and, uh, you know, they, they had 111 fatalities, but they had 185 people survive when no one was supposed to. So um, it, it's, you know, it, this type of situation what was scary. And the first thing that came to mind for me was the fact that uh, last summer, uh, in August, uh, Southwest Airlines had another 737 over the Gulf of Mexico that also had a catastrophic engine failure where part of the engine itself was thrown into the fuselage itself. Yeah. It impacted the aircraft. There were no injuries, nothing along that line. The aircraft landed without further incident. But it did cause the Federal Aviation Administration to issue a uh, directive for those specific engines. Well, yeah, that's the, that's what yeah. we're hearing, Jay. And is it that same engine we think on all 737s? That's not well, just Southwest. Know. Yeah, this was a 737-700 series. Okay. And, and Southwest has about 500 of these aircraft. And I, I'm not sure exactly which aircraft was involved in the one last uh, last year. Mm-hmm. I know that it was, a, it was a CFM engine, which was what uh, um, GE engine or uh, GE uh, manufactured. Uh, but whether or not this was a part of that, I- I'm not sure, because the the actual directive was a CFM 56-7B version of that particular engine, that power plant, and I'm not sure if the one yesterday uh, that was I- involved. And one of the things the NTSB is going to do as part of their massive investigation is to basically go through that aircraft uh, engine, go through the maintenance records. They're going to basically do everything they can to see exactly what they can learn about that. Of course, the problem is that we have pieces of this airplane scattered across the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah, exactly. They, they can't recover them all, can they? Well, hopefully they can recover enough, because yeah. they're going to basically have to find out where this problem started. Right. And then the sequence of events that led to the failure, and then, of course, uh, you know what uh, happened that kept that uh, from being contained. These engines are designed so that when something goes wrong inside, it stays inside. Yeah. You don't have things flying out. So, uh, you know, and to have a, a decompression where an, a window's impacted and you have a passenger that's thrown to and partially through that open window um, it is just horrifying. Well, and, uh, you know. to make it even more horrifying, Jay Ratliff, our aviation expert on the South Florida Morning Show, we had a uh, military aviation guy, a uh, more of a technical kind of person on the air last hour, I believe it was, mm-hmm. said, said something that scared the life out of me with these particular engines where... Something could go wrong when it's actually on the ground and throw the balance off on this thing, and you wouldn't notice any problem till hours later. A foreign object. Yeah, it, well, yeah, the foreign object uh, debris and, and things of this nature is something we're always concerned with. Yeah. One of the reasons we do, we see uh, continual uh, runway inspections to make sure nothing has fallen off of an aircraft or anything else that might be ingested by an aircraft behind it. Uh, that's what led to the tragedy of the Concorde crash yeah, uh, when it right. went down, as it ingested uh, 
um, or ran over a piece of debris from a former aircraft that was taking off before. Uh, but one of the questions I'm getting a lot is, you know, Jake, can anybody even survive if if they're blown partially out of the the window of of a jet at altitude? Good question. You can if you do a British uh, a search on British Airways Flight 5390, especially an image search, you will not believe what you see because you're going to think it's Photoshop because British Airways 5390 and 1990 had one of the windows in the cockpit blow out. It was installed incorrectly, pressurized, out it went, and the captain of that particular flight goes out the window. Oh, my God. Wow. He grabs onto his legs and oh. his uh, feet. They're holding him. They can't pull him back in because of the speed of the aircraft. They declare an emergency. The co-pilot is trying to land that crippled aircraft. Um, 20 minutes later, <laughs> the airplane lands. The captain is still strewn over the outside top of the aircraft. Wow. Oh, my God. 20 he's minutes flying, later. He's flying five months later for British Airways. So maybe it was wow. the, sh- the shrapnel was what was more deadly in this case. Well, we don't know if it was shrapnel. We don't know if uh, the decompression caused uh, the passenger to be thrown right. against the interior of the cock- uh, the flight, uh, uh, the, the interior that might have caused uh, a neck injury or... It, there, there's just a lot of unknowns. The the autopsy is really going to reveal uh, what happened here, and, and they're also going to have to find out. Okay, was there a seatbelt malfunction? Well, I true, did right? Particular oh. person not have a seatbelt on. Right. So I mean, th- there's so many questions that have to be answered here, and they will be answered because the the National Transportation Safety Board. It's normally a 12 to 18 month investigation. It won't be anywhere near that long before we have a preliminary idea of, of what they're looking at. Right. Uh, but but these individuals know that this particular aircraft on a Boeing 737, which is the workhorse of aviation around the world, uh, they're going to find out what happened. So they, if there's they, a problem with inspections, with maintenance, with that type of engine, they're going to find out as quickly as they can so that if any directives need to be issued to other airlines around the right. world to check things, uh, it'll be done quickly. They have to. They, it, you're right. This is such a uh, you know user friendly air, aircraft that's used in so many different flights. They got to get an answer. And Jay, as we wrap up here, just real quickly, just to go back to the amazing heroics from this pilot uh, yesterday. The only information that she's trying to relay it to uh, the tower is what she's being told by the crew, right? Because she said, well, they're telling me there's a hole in the plane. I'm getting this. I'm getting that. She just has to rely on, on, on their eyewitness account, feeding it back up to her in the front, right? Well, they do. And, and there's not a lot of co- communication that's going on between the flight attendants and the crew at that point. They're, they're finding out, okay, there's an issue. We've got our alarms. We know something's wrong. We need to land. Uh, some passengers said, well, we weren't really getting timely updates from the from the crew. Well, <laughs> guess what? They're what? flying the stupid airplane. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the, the last thing a crew is going to do is, you know, de- deviate from their emergency checklist to communicate to people in the back what's going on. Yeah. There's times they don't even have time to communicate to air traffic control because they're trying to regain control of their aircraft. So, right. um, you know, in, in this situation, they'll learn. Uh, the flight crew, air traffic control, which I thought was a little gabby when you listen to the uh, to the uh, uh, recording. Mm-hmm. I think there was a little bit too much uh, dialogue going back and forth between the air traffic control, who seemed to be a lot more frantic than the than the captain was. Uh, I think you're right. Board the aircraft, so unbelievable. Evan, if I hear of one person who was complaining about not getting a snack on this flight, I swear to God, Jay <laughs> Jay Ratcliffe, you're always awesome, our aviation expert. Appreciate your time so much, buddy. My pleasure.